realised the other day that we haven't spoken about cults in quite a while, so today I want to dedicate a whole episode to some of the craziest cults I've come across in my time researching history and true crime. I love making these listicle episodes and you guys seem to really enjoy them too, so confirm or deny in the comments. A cult is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as a system of religious veneration and devotion towards a particular figure or object. Each cult has its own focus, its own thing, which is usually defined as religious in nature, but not always. The characteristics of a cult include authoritarian control with a powerful leader, extremist beliefs, isolation from society, and veneration of a single individual. Usually veneration of the leader, but not always. And there are generally thought to be four types of cult. Number one, doomsday cults, people coming together to prepare for the end of the world, think maybe the Branch Davidians in Waco. There's political cults, so QAnon perhaps. Religious cults, which are a dime a dozen, spiritual beliefs being the basis, whether they're made up or based on a pre-existing religion. And then there's the sex cults. And whilst a lot of cults do feature some component of sexual abuse, some are just all about sex. Nexium, for example, which I will do a full video on one day, but that, that would be a very big one. I really want to do it, but very overwhelming. So yeah, there are a lot of cults out there and you've probably heard of a lot of them but guaranteed there are way, way more that you haven't heard of and that's why I'm here today. We're gonna to be talking about three cults that you probably haven't heard of. You might have done, but you probably haven't. But first though, let me just swap over to Future Georgia to talk about today's sponsor. A fun fact about me is that I'm actually a very fussy eater and I know it's a flaw of mine. I've been working on it. I'm loads better than I used to be, but still there are certain things like tomatoes, peppers, fish, no, can't do it. But one of the main things that's helped me over the years is HelloFresh. Like I went through a phase a few years ago because I've used HelloFresh for many, many years now. Wait, look at this, wait. Many, many years I've used HelloFresh for. These are just like some of the recipes that I decided to keep. I went through a phase where I would sort of challenge myself to order a meal each week where it's something that I wouldn't usually go for. Like push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit. And honestly, it did help. Like I'm so much better now than I used to be. But anyway, in case you weren't able to tell, this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. I have used HelloFresh for many years, as you just saw. I am a massive, massive fan. And honestly, the most exciting part of my week sometimes is getting my box. Cause I always order my recipes and then I forget what I've ordered. So let's see, let's see what I've got this week. So honestly, I can't remember. Oh my God, yeah, okay, we've got the hoisin pulled beef bao buns. Shut up, seriously. We've got the spicy honey glazed chicken and the Thai style peanut chicken stir fry, which just looks like incredible. That looks so good. This summer has just been so crazy busy for me with planning a wedding and my life has just been going about 100 miles an hour. Even things like going to the supermarket has been off the table. Like I have not had time to go to the supermarket in weeks. I work all day and then in the evenings we've just been wedding planning and honestly like finding meals if it wasn't for HelloFresh would have been such a pain. But HelloFresh makes it so easy because once a week I know that this box is going to turn up at my door. I'm going to have, I usually order three meals, like three fresh meals just waiting on my doorstep. You can get quick recipes, all the ingredients are pre-packaged and it just saves me so much time and energy as well. Like the mental energy of trying to think what you're gonna have for dinner and then go to the supermarket each week and buy it all. Or if you're like me, pop to the local shop each day and spend so much money on like the exact ingredients I'm gonna need and it just becomes a whole thing. And I just, I love HelloFresh, you guys, I love it. I just find for my lifestyle, HelloFresh is so much more budget friendly. Like I save so much money with doing this every week rather than going to the shop and spending a load of money on ingredients that I'm never gonna use up, realistically. Like I'm never gonna use it. And also it just makes my daily routine so much easier. We've even got, oh my God, I forgot we ordered this. We've got some goo chocolate souffles. Another fun fact about me, maybe I should start with this. I actually don't like chocolate. I don't, sorry. I don't like chocolate, but my fiance very much does. So I'm sure she is going to eat these and very much enjoy them. Um, what else we got? <gasps> is that a Pilsner, is that a beer? Also, I don't like beer either. I told you, I'm fussy, I don't like beer. But my fiance also does. Like she's gonna, that was such a treat for her. She's gonna love that. 
You know, I also don't love little kitty cats trying to get in my way when I'm filming videos. This time of year with all the kids going back to school as well, like I'm 30 years old, but I still live my year by like school years. I always find like a lot of comfort in doing like a back to school routine around this time of year, like buying myself some new nice stationery and like really getting myself organized and planned for the months ahead. So, and with my life having been so manic over the past few months and with the wedding nearly done, I'm very looking forward to just like getting back into a routine and HelloFresh is very much gonna help me with that. Anyway, if you want to try HelloFresh for yourself, I of course have a discount code for you. If you use back with Georgia, that's back with Georgia, all one word, it'll be on the screen, I'm sure, you can get 60% off your first box, 20% off every single box for two months, and free desserts for life. Like you could have a goo chocolate souffle every week for free. Like that's amazing. I just love working with HelloFresh. They've been one of my favorite brands for many years, even way before they ever contacted me about any sponsorships. And I cannot rave about them enough. Like genuinely, I just really, really adore them. I need to choose which one of these I'm gonna do for dinner tonight now. I have no idea what I'm gonna choose, but you would have probably already seen in the overlay, which is very exciting for you. I've got so much to look forward to. Okay, with cult number one, let's stay on the food theme. Let's start with a man who created an entire cult based on his favorite fruit the coconut. In November 1875, August Engelhardt was born in Nuremberg in what was at the time the German Empire. We don't know loads about his childhood so we're going to skip forward to university where he studied physics and chemistry, but then he formed an interest in pharmacy, going on to work as a pharmacy assistant. August was the son of a factory owner, he had been deeply entrenched in industrialism his whole life and now in his role in the pharmacy he was, for the first time, actually paying attention to health, to what people were putting in their bodies. And from here he formed this deep, deep interest in health and that led him to the rising German ideal of Lebensreform, translated to life reform. It was this idea that kind of rejected all forms of industrialism, they wanted to embrace nature, including alternative medicine, raw food, sexual liberation, and the rejection of all mind-altering substances. So that's alcohol, drugs, and according to them, vaccines. Oh yeah, the anti-vaxxers always been around even in the 1800s. August believed in the purity of the human body and of society as a whole. I mean, Lieben's reform was quite progressive for the 18, sort of 80s, 1890s, where the layperson's understanding of the human body would have been incredibly basic. I mean, miasma theory, the idea that disease was spread by bad smells, wasn't even abandoned until after 1880. So the idea of like germ theory was really new. And here were the Lieben's reform people really paying attention to what's going on in the human body. August Engelhardt was a hippie before hippies were a thing. He grew this very, very long beard, he didn't wear many clothes, he believed in living closely alongside nature, and he spoke very openly about his spiritual beliefs, which as you can imagine, were not well received in a Victorian German society. In 1898, August co-authored a book with the incredibly succinct and snappy title, A Carefree Future, The New Gospel, Glimpse into the Death and Distance for the Selection of Mankind and the Reflection of All for Consideration and Simulation, in which we saw the first glimpses of his future. He wrote a lot of passages in this book about coconuts, a wildly exotic fruit that absolutely did not grow in Germany, but he was enamoured. He wrote poems entitled Mother Coconut, The Coconut Spirit, and of course the classic How to Become a Coconut. But what exactly was it about coconuts in particular that captured August's attention? Well, he came to believe that because coconuts grow high up in trees, closer to the sun, they are therefore closer to God. And therefore, by eating coconuts, you can become closer to God. And maybe, just maybe, you can become immortal as well, because coconuts help man overcome all sickness. That's what he believed. Listen, we're talking about wild cults here, I'm not promising that everything is going to make sense. He called his coconut diet cocoverism, but it wasn't a very easy diet to lead in Germany because as I've already said, coconuts did not grow there. They could be imported, but I can imagine they were wildly expensive. In 1899, August joined a group of people called the Youngborn and they were an association for wild living, focusing on the principles of vegetarianism and nudism. 
August integrated himself and then took it one step further. He started preaching to them about cocoverism, making these public lectures around the country. And of course, this did not go down well. People just thought he was a little bit insane. And besides, Youngborn would soon come into a bit of trouble themselves because they were preaching all about the wonders of nudity. But nudity was not only considered immoral in the German Empire, but also it was straight up illegal. I mean, it still is in many countries, most countries. The Youngborn leader was sent to jail and August was disgusted by the constraints the German Empire put on him as a citizen. I mean, if he wanted to only eat coconuts and be naked all day, why couldn't he do that? Which does raise some interesting questions because like he wasn't harming anyone else like at this point anyway, so why couldn't he do that? Like, why? But no worries, because then August came into quite a decent inheritance. Sure, he was a hippie who hated industrialism and capitalism in the modern world, but he was gonna take advantage of the winds when they came his way. He took his inheritance and quickly headed to an island called Cabacon, which is a small island in what was at the time split between German New Guinea and the British territory of Papua, now Papua New Guinea. A colonialism. Also, I always thought it was pronounced Papua New Guinea. That's how I've always heard it, how I've always said it. But in researching for this, it was Papua New Guinea. Somebody please tell me what's correct. The internet tells me it's Papua, but in real life I've only ever heard Papua. Mind blown. Capricorn is a tiny island, it's only 1.4 square miles, and when he arrived, August bought a solid quarter of it, 185 acres, of the Queen Emma Colby Forsyth Company. He bought a banana and coconut plantation, of course. He brought along with him his entire library, 1,200 books, and nothing else. No clothing, nothing. He believed that humans shouldn't be constrained to living in houses, which he equated to caves. He hand-built himself a hut and lived as close to nature as possible. He was the only foreign person, only white person, living amongst about 40 Melanesian people on Cabacon. Like I said, really, really tiny island. In doing so, he did attract a decent amount of international attention. A New York Times article from 1905 wrote of August, his plan was to have his sect worship the sun. He held that man was a tropical animal, not intended to live in caves called houses, but to wander as Adam did, with the sun beating upon him all day and the dews of heaven for a mantle at night. Living such a life, he believed that the healing and curative powers of the sun would in time render a man so immune that sickness could be overcome. When August first moved to the island, he didn't consume a solely coconut diet. He did have a fully vegetarian, fully raw diet. He ate things grown on the island and a lot of coconuts. But when he got an ulcer on his leg, he surmised that it was caused by tropical fruits. And that's when he went full coconut. According to Healthline, coconuts are high in calories and high in fat, but they can cause weight gain with excessive consumption. I am guessing they say that with the assumption that people are also eating other foods as well, not just coconuts. Coconuts are rich in antioxidants, copper, iron, selenium, all things your body desperately needs. They're high in fiber and protein, and there's some evidence they can help regulate blood sugar, but they're also missing a lot of very important vitamins that your body needs. A coconut's a very good, healthy snack on occasion, absolutely. Good for a mono diet? No, definitely not. You might be thinking at this point, Georgia, this man is strange, but a cult he is not. But he got there, he did reach cult levels. He believed in his coconut so deeply that he named his movement Son and Order, and translating to Order of the Sun, and he wrote letters to people back in Germany, presumably people he'd connected with through Lebensreform and Youngborn, people who already shared his general principles. And he convinced about 15 people to travel to Cabacon to join him, telling them in his letters not to worry about malaria, which was a big concern in traveling to tropical countries I mean even still today, because the warmth of the sun and coconuts would heal whatever ailments they got. I mean, this coconut cult was a very small cult in the grand scheme of things, but it was still a cult in which they worshipped coconuts. As you could probably imagine, joining the cult didn't end well for many people. One rather fanatic follower was 24-year-old Henrik Eukens, who couldn't hack the very physical lifestyle on the island and he dropped dead after just a few weeks. 
Another was Max Lutzlow, who August Engelhardt quickly realised that he could not stand. Max brought his entire music collection with him to the island, and this music was not to August's taste. Apparently, Max used to drive him mad with his very bad music. I mean, Max was literally a conductor and player with the Orchestra of Berlin, but August just wasn't a fan. After one fight they had, Max somehow ended up stranded on a boat in the middle of the ocean, but there was no fresh fruit on board, so he refused to eat. By the time he did eventually make it back to shore, he was incredibly ill and ended up dying. August von Bethmann Alzelben was another cult member who joined in mid-1905, and he seemingly loved his time on Cabocon. He wrote many accounts of how great life was there. But then by September 1906, he apparently started having doubts. He just couldn't get on board with the whole nudist aspect of the cult. A mono diet of coconuts, fine, nudity, bad. He wrote in a letter that he'd be leaving as soon as possible for Germany, but ended up dying of malaria before he could end up boarding a ship. But Bethman and Engelhart also argued during his time there, he argued with a lot of people it seems, about Bethman's wife Anna Schwab, who he married on the island shortly after she arrived in mid-1906. So this was sort of towards the end of his own time in life and on the island. Anna believed somewhat in the lifestyle, but she wanted everyone to be eating tropical fruits as a whole rather than just coconuts, and that was akin to blasphemy. When Bethman died, August Engelhardt blamed the tropical fruits for his death, so Anna got on a boat back to Germany and started telling anyone who would listen about what was going on. After that point, the governor banned anyone else from going to join this cult in Cabocon, which probably did genuinely save numerous lives. As you can imagine, the majority of other cult members also ended up dying. I mean, heat stroke, drowning, malnutrition, of course, diseases such as malaria, because coconuts do not have magical anti-malaria powers, despite what August Engelhardt said. Apparently, one cult member even died after being struck by a coconut falling out of a tree. You cannot make this up. August was just convinced that everyone who died on the island had cheated on their diets and that was their punishment, that they had been eating things other than coconuts, so of course they were going to die, they were being punished by God. Coconuts were God's fruit at the end of the day, they grew close to the sun and therefore closer to God, and if you didn't eat them, you'd be punished, apparently. Eventually, pretty much everyone who hadn't died decided they should probably leave the island. It was quite clear that their leader was a madman, and they did, leaving August alone once again. Over the next few years, they would have the random person like coming and joining for a short time or staying until the end, but like his cult with 15 members, that didn't last too long. He didn't quite have the convincing charisma of other cult leaders, he couldn't convince them to stay. But August was pretty committed to his beliefs, like he wasn't going to leave. But as you can probably imagine, his own health wasn't in the best way. He was incredibly malnourished, he was skin and bones, he was not healthy at all. People who saw him in this time, because he did become somewhat of a tourist attraction, like people would literally go to Capricorn just to see him, said that he was incredibly thin, his skin was covered in lesions, and he had deformities. I presume from his bones just not having the vitamins that they needed. For a really long time, he refused any sort of medical treatment until he was so weak that he could no longer put up a fight. And when he eventually got taken to hospital, he weighed just 86 pounds and they nursed him back to health, only for him to escape back to Capricorn as soon as he was healthy enough to do so and it all started again. This guy survived for so many years when he probably shouldn't have. Like, some people's bodies can just withstand malnutrition better than others. And then the Great War rolled around, World War I, and this was, of course, German New Guinea. August was a German man. German New Guinea was captured, and August was eventually captured as a prisoner of war and was kept in an Australian camp. And he managed to survive that. I'm not sure what it was they fed him whilst he was in prison, but I can imagine it probably wasn't coconuts, like it probably actually improved his health somewhat. But they eventually released him back to his island when they realised that he was incredibly mentally ill and wouldn't be really much use to them as a prisoner. By the time he returned to his island though, his land had been overtaken by another German man who later sold it to his Australian wife in order to protect it from the war. But August just continued living on the island like in general, like he didn't need his specific land, he could just live there, outside. 
August Engelhart survived a shockingly long time like this, but on the 6th of May 1919, he was found dead on the beach. He was only in his mid-40s and he was found just incredibly, incredibly malnourished. He also had one final follower with him on the island who also died just four days later. And this is what I often don't get about cults because you're free to live your own life the way you want as long as it's not harming other people. Like if you want to move to an island and live on coconuts only, like crack on. But why involve other people? It's just a level of ego that I will never understand. Like August 100% believed that he was correct, that his worldview was the only correct one. Even when evidence clearly pointed to the contrary, like he never wavered, people were dying and he didn't care. I want to say that he was clearly suffering with some severe form of mental illness, but also I don't want to dismiss his actions as purely being because of mental illness. Because lots of people are mentally ill. Most people don't start cults and kill people, like indirectly or not. Maybe we could put this one down to religious fanaticism, perhaps? Like, Lieben's reform and Youngborn don't really align with like Christianity. But this was all about God, like he truly believed that he, if he ate coconuts he was closer to God. It's very interesting. For cult number two today, we're actually gonna be staying on the Pacific Islands, but this one couldn't be more different. As far as cults go, this one is actually rather harmless, and it's what's referred to as the John Froome cult, or John Frum cult. Again, I heard it pronounced different ways. This is what's called a cargo cult, which is a system of beliefs found in the Melanesian islands based around the expected arrival of ancestral spirits in ships and planes bringing cargoes of food and other goods. Cargo cults are something that have been noted in parts of Melanesia since the late 19th century, especially since the world wars and the worldwide occupation during those times. For the vast majority of indigenous Melanesian people, the wars were their first encounter with people outside of their communities, outside of their islands. And they were seeing these different forces, soldiers marching on the beaches and bringing with them massive abundance. These soldiers would march on the beaches, salute, chant, raise flags, and then planes and ships would arrive and drop off all kinds of goods for the soldiers. To the indigenous Melanesian people, it seemed like magic, it seemed like the act of a higher power. So when the wars, World War II specifically, came to an end and the military bases and islands were suddenly abandoned, all the soldiers left, the indigenous people would mimic the actions of the troops to try and get the cargo ships and planes to show up again. Years passed, the word travelled down through oral tradition and cults formed of people just trying to make these goods appear once again. It does go deeper than that because of course it does. These were entire communities who were colonized during the wars. Missionaries were sent to teach them about Christianity and the so-called right beliefs to have. In these decades, the indigenous people had their entire world turned upside down. Their entire understanding of the world was turned upside down. They're thrown into a war that had nothing to do with them. They've got these soldiers on their beaches fighting for countries that are so wildly removed from them that they may not have even heard of them before. They're forcibly modernized for lack of a better word. Our Earth does not just consist of the Western world, there are whole communities out there so far removed from our Western life experiences, and that's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a neutral thing, it's just a fact. Like, the Western world does not affect everyone, it does not touch everyone. So when the war ended and the islands were abandoned by the troops, everything was upside down, like life didn't quite function in the same way that it did before. So some experts posit that the cargo cults might have been the local leaders' ways of taking back control. If you can't beat them, join them kind of mentality. Let's merge our traditional culture with the new way of life that's been forced upon us. Let's worship the cargo that once turned up on our shores. So the local leaders continued with these rituals that they'd seen the troops doing. And rituals are so important to humanity, like so having a ritual to follow probably made it easier to adjust. Not that cargo has ever fallen from the sky or turned up on the water since, but the rituals are something to do, it's a purpose. The same way that you could argue any religion is a purpose, just a belief system, just a way of living. It's all a ritual. Could this maybe be seen as a worship of Western materialism? Maybe, but it goes so much deeper than that. These people are hoping that a deity will bless them with abundance. 
Perhaps the most famous cargo cult, and potentially the last one left in 2024, is the John Froome cult, which today has less than 500 members. The island country of Vanuatu is located in the South Pacific, and one of the most southern islands is Tanna. After Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in World War II, US military settled on Tanna, and this is a fairly small place, it's just 210 square miles, and today has a population of around 30,000 people, but it would have been less in the 40s. Today, it's only people residing in the village of Lamakara that still worships John Froome, with missionaries having successfully converted the rest of the island to Christianity from their very traditional ancestral beliefs, of course. Today, the origins of John Froome are complicated, like no one quite knows where the name came from after generations of oral tradition. Some believe that it began as early as the 1910s, but the more popular theories believe it began in the 1940s with the military. When the US soldiers arrived, it said that at first the people on Tanna were fascinated. This wasn't the first time that foreign people had landed on their shores, but it was certainly the first time that they had in such huge numbers. The native people watched as machines appeared from the sky and dropped off goods, unlike anything they'd ever seen. It was like magic, and if you've never seen planes before, I can imagine it all seemed absolutely crazy. The bravest of the locals would go down to the beach to the airstrip and they would scavenge what they could from the area. They'd bring the items back to their villages where they were held in high regard. Even something as simple as a bottle of coke to them became a magical item. Remember, this was the 1940s, there was no internet, there was no social media, like you didn't see these insights into other parts of the world unless they turned up on your shores. But then the war came to an end and the US military left as quickly as they arrived, leaving the locals with no answers as to what on earth had just gone on. So they build their own airstrips and they start to copy the soldiers' chants and routines in an effort to summon the machines from the sky. They believed they needed to appeal to the spirits, to a god, and that's how it would turn up. Where the name John Froome comes from has actually always baffled researchers. Some say the name actually began as John Broom, perhaps a name that locals overheard the colonizers saying, or perhaps it appeared on some of the cargo at some point, maybe. Some anthropologists think that maybe it was like John from America. Maybe that was a real soldier stationed on Tanner who was particularly generous, maybe he handed out items to the locals. Maybe that's how he introduced himself, like John from America. Again, I really wasn't sure how Froome was pronounced. Like John Froome, John from, I wasn't sure. There's stories of John being the alias of a native man who started dressing in a western style, going round telling the locals that he was going to bring them clothing and food. Others say that this cult started as the result of a trip-induced vision brought on by the kava plant, which has mild psychoactive properties and is found on Tanna. It's said that in this vision, John Froome promised that all the white people would be leaving, leaving behind all of their supplies to the native people. However, if this was to happen, he said, the people of Tanna had to reject all aspects of Western society and return to traditional customs. Another version of events shared by the colonizers on Tanner at the time was that it began around 1940 when a load of locals started painting their faces white and talking in falsetto voices about how the whites were about to be banished and then huge quantities of cargo were going to arrive for them. So basically, all of this to say, no one has any clue where this began. Like, they don't know who John is or where he came from. And even the practices can seem to go against what the cult stands for, which does reject Western tradition taking over their island. The worshippers of John Froome regard him as the mighty king of America, who is going to bless them with goods one day, coming from machines from the sky. And it's likely they don't associate John Froome with the Western world at all. There was never any explanation as to how any of this happened. So whilst they actively reject like Western tradition coming in and destroying their own tradition, they also might not associate the cargo with Western world, if that makes sense. Of course, for cult members today, it gets a bit more complicated, but we are talking about the people in the 1940s, the 1950s, just absolutely baffled by everything that's going on on their island. So yeah, nowadays there might be more explanation, but as we've already covered, ritual is something so important for humanity, for small communities such as Lamakara.
One village member explained to theorist John G. Melton back in 1985 that we live here in Lamakara a very peaceful life. Chief Isaac leads us all. He has rules for many things so that we live according to our traditions. And like I said, there is a huge focus on custom on Tana. And after many generations, this just became the new custom, new tradition. They are living as their ancestors lived. They worship, they march, they chant, they follow the same rituals their parents and grandparents did before them in the hope of life just getting a little bit better, of being rewarded with goods from the sky. Do they need to truly understand what it is they're hoping for? Like, is the hope just enough? I mean, many religions are based on much less than the John Froome cultists. Like people witnessed with their own eyes as the planes arrived from the skies and provided people with goods. In a very unsure time, it gave the people of Tana something to focus on. In the 1970s, with the imminent independence of Vanuatu, the John Froome cult actually opposed it. They feared that a centralized government would favor the Western world. It would favor modernity and Christianity. They believed that an independent government would be detrimental to their local customs, which were born from the Western world, but it had kind of become so much more than that. Over the years, there have been multiple European people who have claimed to be the Messiah John Froome, whom some believe is one day going to turn up on Tana and bring prosperity to the island. You can only imagine that some people take advantage of this, like the most famous of whom was probably Claude Philippe Berger. He claimed that in 1999, he was handed the title and in 2011 visited the island of Tanna, claiming that he was there to fulfill their prophecy. He promised development and investment, new roads, water tanks and solar lamps. When he was back in France, he would literally claim to be a king. He styled himself as the traditional king of Tanna and found himself actually in aristocratic circles. In 2021, when he died, there was a parade for him in La Macara, marking his death. Nowadays, John Froome is the smallest it has been in years. Some say that now it's mostly just a tourist attraction, like locals act up for the sake of visitors. But each year in February, John Froome Day is still celebrated, like their ritual is still followed. Okay, for our final cult today, let's move away from the islands and head instead to Japan, the Honohana Sampogyo, a cult dedicated to feet, or at least to reading feet. According to the leader of this cult, Hogan Fukunaga, your feet are an insight into your life. The shape of your toes, the depth of your instep, all tell the story of your future. Which at a baseline does sound innocent enough, but of course, it's in this episode, it got dark. Hogan told people that if they didn't get their feet tread, they could die, and then charged them extortionate amounts for the pleasure of it. A for-profit cult. This, this was a for-profit cult. In the year 2000, the Japanese courts found him guilty of fraud and ordered him to pay the equivalent of over $2 million to 27 former cult members. But let's go back to the beginning. So Hogan Fukunaga, real name Teriyoshi Fukunaga, was just your normal electrician until the 80s rolled around and he realized that he was the reincarnation of Buddha and Jesus, or at least he claimed he realized that. It may or may not have been that he realized he was 500 million yen in debt. That's about $3.5 million or 2.6 million pounds. How anyone finds themselves in that much debt, I do not know, but clearly he needed a way to make money and fast. And the obvious answer is to claim to be the reincarnation of two religious figures and create a foot cult. Obviously, I can't believe I didn't think of it first. Or maybe he really did think he was Jesus Buddha, like who am I to judge? Throughout the 80s, Hogan gets ghostwriters to write a load of books for him and he becomes a household name in Japan, before in 1987 he gains official recognition by the government as a religious corporation. Hono Hana Sampogyo was officially a religion. Now I struggled to find a literal translation of what this means, and I'm sure that I am horribly butchering that pronunciation, like no doubt, but I think it might translate roughly to flowers of Buddhist teachings or maybe flower of law, something along those lines. What the religion did is similar to palm reading, is Hogan and the other leaders would read the soles of people's feet in order to share the truth about their futures, to explain some things about their life that they're struggling with, for the low, low cost of about $900. 
Upon examination, the reader would inevitably find that the person had some sort of serious illness or was about to run into some horrible misfortune. They were going to die young, get cancer, go bankrupt, lose their entire family in some grisly accident. But all was not lost because Hogan had supernatural healing powers and if this person attended some training sessions and purchased some items that were ward off evil, then their future would miraculously be cured of whatever awful thing was coming their way. Hogan had spent years writing books, making himself a household name, building a name for himself as this incredible healer. All sorts of stories were told in his books about the people that he'd healed. And Japan was kind of the perfect conditions for this kind of cult at this time. For decades there had been economic uncertainty, which naturally leads people to search for spiritual guidance. Shinto and Buddhism were or are Japan's two major religions, but similar probably to Christianity here in the UK, for most Japanese people, their religions are more of a cultural thing rather than a natural religious thing, like how most people in the UK celebrate Christmas, but don't consider themselves religious. Like Shinto and Buddhism are kind of the same in Japan. The people celebrate the festivals and follow the religious rituals at weddings and funerals, but they don't consider themselves to be particularly religious, if that makes sense. And that's for a portion of the population, not everyone, of course. But as soon as a country falls on hard times, as soon as there's any sort of uncertainty, you do see a massive uptick in people turning to religion, or if not religion, spirituality in some form. So people came to Hogan and the other leaders, they were already predisposed to believing in his powers and his story. Like your regular person wasn't about to spend thousands of yen on a foot reading, but a follower, a believer, would do it quite happily. And then when they're told that they've got these awful things coming to them, they already know the stories of the people who Hogan had healed in the past, the stories of the lives that he's fixed. I mean, they weren't true, but they didn't know that. So of course these people are going to invest and they're going to pay the money to get fixed. People were conned out of thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds, millions of yen. And if somebody caught on to what was going on or didn't want to pay the money, the cult leaders wouldn't be scared to make specific threats. One victim was apparently visited by the cult officials multiple times until they agreed to spend the equivalent of $22,000 for a five day training seminar to purify his mind and bodies. And these five day training seminars were quite common, like it was a big money maker for the cult. And don't get me wrong, while some people did have to be threatened into paying to attend, plenty of people like did go willingly. In 1999, the cult came under fire when four members died during one of these training sessions and nobody really knows what happened except one of them fell to his death from the window of a second floor bathroom. I don't know if the rest of the victims died in the same way, but I do know that apparently the Fuji Fire Department, where the headquarters was based, responded to 12 similar calls over five years of people falling out of windows. Like, it's not even subtle here that something really weird is going on. Reports say that the training seminars were really harsh and required people to go without sleep for days on end as they were forced to roam the streets declaring that they were living a happy and healthy life. And it's no secret that sleep deprivation can lead to reduced cognitive ability and impaired logical reasoning. Essentially, you can make really bad choices, like really impulsive choices, when you're being denied sleep. Potentially choices like trying to escape by jumping out of a window. And that's me being generous to the cult, like assuming that these weren't attempted murders by the leaders. Apparently after the sleep deprivation, people would be taken into rooms where the cult leaders would coerce them into paying even larger sums of money with some pretty horrific threats. Like it was just awful. The cult leaders would be told to constantly recruit people into the ranks, either as patients or as new leaders. They wanted to have 3,000 people a month attend the training program. They wanted to entice 300,000 visitors to the headquarters in Fiji. Apparently, a heavenly voice gave Hogan the number of 300,000, and he was willing to do anything to coerce the people into attending. In the early 90s, Hogan went to visit Nagasaki, where a volcano had recently erupted, and he told the locals if 7,000 people in the prefecture underwent their training for one whole year, there would be no more volcanic eruptions, like that was it. 
And there's no doubt that he would have got sign-ups on the back of this because eruptions were life-changing and terrifying. They killed people. The locals were scared and he knew exactly where to hit them to get them to be willing to spend this money. The people who were fully taken in by the training would eventually be turned into leaders to recruit more people and so it went on. One man in his 60s reportedly went to Hogan because he was worried that he'd contracted HIV, with Hogan obviously taking a quick look at his feet and declaring that he definitely, definitely had contracted it, saying that his life was bad in the past, present and future. He told the man that he had no doubt that the doctor was going to diagnose him with AIDS, but all was not lost because for around $6,000, he could take part in a session to help him. And of course, the man paid it. Then magically, he was declared free of HIV and was told to take home a magic scroll, for which he was charged $34,000. Yes, like crazy amounts of money. They say you can't put a price on good health, but it seems that Hogan for Kanaga definitely did that. And people were very scared, they were willing to pay it. Death scares people, they'll do anything to avoid it. I mean, it is one of the main reasons why religion is such a huge comfort to people. People want to know there's life after death, that this life isn't the end. Okay, my camera ran out and then I had an appointment to go get a facial and so it's now three hours later and I'm wearing no makeup, but I wanna finish this video off, so let's go. One woman in the cult used her entire life savings and took out loans to pay them to cure her daughter's chronic insomnia. And when she didn't take part in the sessions held by Hogan, he told her that it was her fault that her daughter was suffering, telling her, because you didn't listen to the voice of heaven, your daughter received punishment from heaven. So he truly preyed on people's worst fears. Meanwhile, he's walking around in custom made designer suits. He was buying audiences of people like the Pope, Mother Teresa, Margaret Thatcher, Bill Clinton, and his wife was spending thousands of dollars a month on clothes. And they are literally sending people into bankruptcy so they can do this. Like, how do you live with yourself? Like, how do you not have any morals whatsoever? By the late 90s, the authorities were paying very close attention to Hono Hanna, especially after they failed to report income tax in 1997. And then in 1999, three women filed a fraud lawsuit against Hogan for Kanaga, causing a raid of the headquarters. Over the next three years, over 1,000 more people would file similar claims, all for an amount totaling 5.4 billion yen. I think once the first lawsuit was filed, it was kind of like a snowball effect. Like people read about it in the papers and they filed their own lawsuits and soon everyone was filing them. Hogan argued that all he did was deliver the voice of God and questioned why that would be considered fraud. Obviously, Hono Hanna was granted a certain level of protection because it was legally a religious sect. He said the court was infringing on his freedom of religion. But it was so bad that even that couldn't protect him. The judge stated that his religion was nothing but systematic fraud. He was handed a 12 year prison sentence and 15 other people, higher up leaders in the cult, were also charged and sentenced with mass fraud. They were also charged with practicing medicine without a license. The cult, not Hogan himself, but the cult, had to pay back the equivalent of millions of dollars to 27 people that he told were going to die if they didn't join, so they felt like they had no choice. In March 2001, Hono Hanna was officially declared bankrupt, and Hogan would have since been released from prison probably around 2011-2012, but there's never been a single whisper of him since. You could say maybe he learned his lesson, but... Probably not. He destroyed so many people's lives. Like people took out these massive amounts of money, huge loans to try and save themselves or their loved ones from what they thought was going to be certain death. Some people did that and still died, but not through any illness, through mysteriously falling out of windows. Hogan truly preyed on the most vulnerable people. He preyed on people's biggest fears. And for what? Like, he was always going to end up in prison. Like, he wasn't subtle about what he was doing. It was always only going to end this way. But he did it anyway. Like, what? Why? I wish I was able to provide you with a more, like, well-rounded conclusion as to, like, why people do things like this. But sometimes, with cults, all you can say is, like, why? <laughs> like, why? What's the point? For money? Like, it, he was always going to end up in prison. Like, he wasn't even a good cult leader. It was ridiculous. 
So there you go, there are just three of the craziest cults I've come across whilst researching for my job. And believe me, I have many more on a list somewhere. So if you want to see another video similar to this one, then please let me know in the comments down below and tell me like, do you know of any crazy cults? Like, is there anything that you think I should look into? Because it's so interesting to me. Or even more interesting, have any of you ever fallen victim to a cult? If so, let us know the story in the comments. Like I'd be really intrigued to read it. A huge, huge thank you to everyone for watching today and a huge thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. I know I always say it, I sound like a broken record, but honestly, sponsors are the reason I'm able to keep making these videos, the reason I'm able to keep this channel going. So any of you showing support to my sponsors and support to me is hugely appreciated and I genuinely love HelloFresh as a company. I've used them, we all know at this point, for so, so many years. They genuinely taught me to cook, so it's always my favourite sponsor to get. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.